everyone. Uh, welcome to your two favorite co-hosts. Uh, we have Martina and the lovely Lissette. Uh, and welcome to our podcast slash YouTube channel. We are expanding every day. Uh, we are a perspectives. And um, as you probably heard from our previous video, um, we are focusing on women in executive leaderships and just talking about their journey and their experiences, navigating that world um, as a woman, as a professional, and oftentimes in a very male center environment as well. And we have a wonderful guest who we'll get into in just a bit. Um, but I just wanna turn it over to Lisette if she wanna say anything and then we'll kick it over to our wonderful guest. Yeah, I think just to follow up what you said, Martina, you know, you're really focusing uh, on women uh, in, in different workplaces, you know, whether it's corporate or nonprofit and, and others, uh, and really just sharing about the challenges, uh, about what, has worked for them to kind of navigate uh, the different power structures that exist. Um, and, you know, we do have today someone that's in the nonprofit realm. So we'll hear a little bit about what it looks like, because I think some people have a notion of the nonprofit could be different than corporate America. And, you know, as you all know, Marty and I have done nonprofit as well, and we can suffice say that it's not really that different uh, a lot of the times, um, especially when you're working at a large uh, major nonprofit. So, um, we'll kind of get our, our guest a chance to uh, share a little bit about herself, um, you know, what her role is, and she'll kind of get into what her journey has been uh, uh, getting to her leadership, her executive leadership position. Uh, so uh, I will turn it over to uh, Lisa, who is our guest today. Wonderful. Thanks, Lizette and Martina. I'm so uh, happy to be here and excited for this conversation. Um, it's a, a critical conversation, I think. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to use my voice in this way. Um, as you said, Lizette, I am in the nonprofit sector. I'm an executive for a, um, a actually a global, really an international nonprofit. So a very large um, billion dollar organization. Um, and I, I've been um, in executive roles um, with this organization for the last four or five years, but I've been working across several large nonprofits for probably the last 20 years in a variety of roles from you know, entry level when I started out to um, uh, national leadership roles. So it's kind of run run the gamut. Um, my experience is all in the voluntary health sector. So really looking at um, nonprofits that address or um, uh, really have missions rooted in improving health or uh, addressing or, or really um, eradicating certain disease states. Um, I think you asked a little bit about how I got into yeah. this in my, my journey. Um, and, you know, I, um, when I was a little kid, I, my mom was a stay at home mom. Um, and so she filled her time with you know, the PTA and, and volunteering and doing all of those things. And so from a very young age, I was like that little kid that um, went around trick-or-treating with a UNICEF box instead of a candy bag <laughs> <laughs> and was like punching and making buttons, trying to get people to vote for the school levy, you know, all, all of that type of stuff. So I'd say there's some element of um, service in my blood to mm -hmm. to an extent or yeah. or an affinity um for that um but i had actually planned to be a physical therapist that's what i was going to college for and and really what i thought my life was going to be um and then and this is is probably not an unusual story for how some people get into especially voluntary health nonprofit work but i had a, a death in my family a sudden death my brother um to heart disease when i was in college um, and it was undiagnosed and, and he had just turned 21. So it was very um, earth shattering for, for me and for us. Uh, but my senior year of college, I decided to do a fundraiser in his honor. I was part of this sales and marketing fraternity. And I decided that, you know, I was going to um, raise money for, for um, an organization that would help other people and uh, I had a lot of fun doing that. And I went around and worked with businesses and 
you know, really from a, it was really grassroots. Um, uh, but, you know, raised some money, put together an awareness event, had an opportunity for people to recognize their stories and their loved ones through it. Um, and as I was sitting the summer after graduating college, I was getting ready to go to grad school for PT. And I thought to myself, gosh, do people, do you, like, what is this? Like that fundraiser was really fun. Like, I felt like I really did something there. Are there jobs that do this? I had no idea about this whole industry of the nonprofit sector. And so I started to poke around and see and learn more. Um, and I decided to defer my, um, my uh, plans to go to grad school for PT. And I uh, moved, I was in Ohio at the time, moved to Chicago and took a job with a nonprofit um, as you know a coordinator um, on a fundraising event and um, really just started getting my feet wet and and I never went back. I wound up at one point getting my master's in nonprofit management um, at nights while I worked days um, and uh, just continued on in my career growing progressively um, through that. So it's really become uh, I guess I, I've landed where I, I think I'm meant to be uh, through that all. That is fascinating. Uh, I had heard, I remember hearing a little bit about your your journey uh, and stuff, but to know sort of how you got into it, but also like to discover like that there's something that you're passionate about and there's something that you can actually do. Like that's, you don't always hear people being able to like find that, you know. Uh, especially like early on, right? Like sometimes people take a very long time to find uh, what their passion, being able to actually do that full time for but for you to be able to find it early on. Like that to me is just uh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I feel really lucky for it. And being in the voluntary health space, I get to kind of use that health and science background that I was studying and the the passion for health and wellness, but also marry that with the passion of of changing lives and serving a mission and um, working in the nonprofit sector. So um, yeah, I, I, I'm really, really blessed in that way. You were a busy bee. And you <laughs> early on, <laughs> Lisa, from going with the UNICEFs out trick-or-treating to, you know, unfortunately, you know, having your brother pass at such a young age as well. And that kind of pushed you even further. But um, it's amazing just kind of hearing, hearing your journey and where you and where you are now. And, you know, I think to kind of just continue the conversation, it seems like you already have faced certain challenges anyway, but as you kind of got into the field of nonprofit and moved your way up the chain, because you started as a coordinator, I think you said, and just like it worked your way all the way up, kind of what have been some bumps in the road or things that has further motivated you when you did hit those roadblocks? Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's a great question. And the very first, there's so many stories and examples, but one of the first ones, um, I'll never forget this. So that first job in Chicago working for a nonprofit, when I was that coordinator, I'd done it for a couple of years. My manager left and that position was open. And um, I was essentially doing that role and my role in the gap is, you know, that happens a lot for a lot of us, mm -hmm. but I applied for the role and I was told um, by the VP of, of the department who was a man that I wasn't enough of a cheerleader um, uh, to, and that was the reason for not giving me the role. They said, we want you to keep doing the role while we find someone else. Um, but you're not enough of a cheerleader. And I think there's this, especially when you're a woman in nonprofit, there's this stereotype that people expect you to fit into. That's really bubbly and rah-rah. And, you know, that's the way that you work with donors. And that's the way that like, you know, you're effective. And from that moment on, I kind of set out to prove that wrong. <laughs> so I, I felt like I had great relationships with the volunteer board um, I'd been working with and what they valued most was my authenticity. Um, and so I decided, yeah, I'm going to be true to that. And maybe it's not here and maybe it's not this job, but 
um, I'm going to show that, that that matters. It's not about fitting into a mold. It's about authentically being who you are and serving the mission or moving forward or doing your best work for the job mm-hmm. and that you can be successful being authentic. And so that first, um, that first, you know, disappointment or experience was kind of, um, uh, I guess pivotal in that way, because it it was a negative experience, but it helped me decide who I wanted to be as a leader when I got into leadership roles and and continued to grow. Um, so there's probably a million other <laughs> bumps and obstacles. I mean, I think, um, uh, you know, there's um, looking at the nonprofit industry overall, many times you do have that where you have a largely female workforce, 70 some percent, you know, depending on the year of the nonprofit workforce is female. Yet um, the majority of positions of power or, and that can be, you know, an executive board, or that can be actual people in leadership roles many times are men. Um, So there's a real disconnect in that. And I think that perpetuates things like the stereotypes of, especially in fundraising, like what you're supposed to be if you're a woman um, and how you're supposed to act. Um, I mean, I have stories for days on some of that. One of my first jobs in fundraising, uh, I was told to go to an event and like wear something tight, you know, and, and then, then, then all the people, all the guys will buy raffle tickets from you, right? You know, mm-hmm. wear a tight little thing, maybe some little shorts, that, that kind of thing. And so there's all of these things throughout um, experience, you know, um, roadblocks um, that we've had to experience that I'm sure women experience on the corporate side as well, um, where you have to defend your ideas more. You have to work harder to get half the recognition, you know, and, and um, I think too, just a lot of, of, I've had to battle with um, the need to, to be perfect, you know, that perfectionism thing. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of that comes from the fear that if I'm not perfect, this is all going to fall apart. Like if I'm, if I'm not I don't have the space to mess up because then this donor might not give to me or this, this board member might be angry or um, whatever boss might not forgive whatever it is. So, um, you know, I think that's one of the things when I think of obstacles too that, and a lot of people probably deal with that, but women, especially in the workforce, um, uh, you know, I, I see more and more women who battle with that, that need, that fear of messing up or making a mistake because there could be bigger repercussions for you than there might be for a male counterpart. And so I think, you know, when I think of roadblocks or or things thematically, that's been a big part of my journey as well. When you were talking about that first uh, story that you shared about, you know, having you were bubbly enough it kind of makes me think of like when someone says like why don't you smile more because women get that told so much you know and it just automatically reminded me of that where it's like you're not you know you're not cheerleader like you're supposed to smile and like be this and we're like well that's just not who I am because I've been told like you need to speak more I'm like speak what like I say things and he's talking about things but it's like it, it's really hard to be who you innately are sometimes especially for women because you get questioned and get and there is this perception of how you're supposed to act how you're supposed to be you know like the type of personality you should have um and I see it a lot in fundraising a lot of the time to to your point uh Lisa that you know women are expected to be and and a lot of times you you see either a lot of women having to be that way or learn how to be that way, um, or they're only hiring women that are that way, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and there's like that that sort of thing. And it's, it's hard because if it's not who you neatly are, eventually you get burnt out. Eventually you, you get frustrated and, you know, a job that you thought you were going to love eventually becomes something that you really hate because you just you're never meeting the expectation of others um, yeah. when it's not necessary. Yeah. To, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, um, I've done a number of those like strict, 
strings finders assessments, you know, as they've come out with strings finder 1.0, 2.0, whatever we're at now. Um, And early on in my career, one of my strengths, one of my top strengths was woo, like being a wooer, right? And I think part of it was because that's who I thought I had to be to be successful. To your point, Lizette, like you have to, if I'm going to be a woman in fundraising, I need to be able to woo people and make them like me and, you know, turn on that kind of charm and just be that personality. Um, And as I grew in my career and moved into leadership roles and actually had the, the ability to one, figure out who I am more authentically as a leader, but then I had um, success built up on my resume, right? So early on, you're unproven, right? And then I was able to say, hey, I grew revenue by this so much, or I closed this gift, or I did, you know, I had things that I started to build that track record of success. So I didn't need to say, I'm a wooer, I fit, you know, I could say, this is what I've done, which gave me that track record of success, gave me the space to be mm-hmm. more who I am. And if, when I do the last string spinner I did, that was nowhere on the list, right? Like, woo was nowhere. On nowhere in sight. It was like, you're a teacher and you're strategic and you're, you know, it's all these other things. Um, and people do change over time, but I do think that that was part of it. When, when you're young in fundraising and have to prove yourself, you try to fit a mold on what many of us do, um, try to fit a mold on what we think we're supposed to be like, or how we're supposed to show up. Um, and then it's having some success that sometimes gives you then the freedom to be who you really are. Um, and, you know, not it, it shouldn't be that way, but I, that's definitely was my experience. And I've seen that experience for others, you know, but it's mm-hmm. uh, it's an interesting dynamic uh, as I reflect on it. So I, just, you know, you, um, to me and just in just a little bit, I know about you and speaking with you, you're very confident, you're very well spoken, you're very like eloquent and put together. And so when did you at what point in your career kind of you know feel like you gained that and you felt like hey you know I have this stats I can show you that I've done this that and another like how long did it take you to really get comfortable and feel like hey you know I'm really good at what I do Mm, that's a great question I don't know if it was it, it wasn't like an overnight thing you know you and I I still get nervous, you know, I still, you know, going into a big meeting or if I have an idea or I want to speak up on something, sometimes there's still those nerves or there's still um, doubt uh, or self-doubt. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's been a progression over time and I've had experiences that have helped me um, like getting my master's degree. One of the things we had to do was take, um, it was like a three week, but all day Saturdays weekend course on public speaking. Um, and it was required of everyone. And, and, um, you know, you start getting positive feedback or reinforcement, or you see that people are responding to you and that it just helps a little bit by little, little bit. Um, and you have those experiences to test it out and test the waters, um, in that way at some point, I learned that I was really good at at talking about mission, like the mission of the organization of somehow um, processing it and understanding it in a way that I could convey it to whoever I'm talking to in a way that resonates. And um, I think it was, again, just practicing, like just, I didn't always do it perfectly, but I think once I started figuring out and observing what people respond to and and really being able to talk to the impact we're actually trying to make, um, my confidence grew. So, So the more I understood what we were trying to deliver, the more confident I felt in it being worthy and right too, and being able to convey that increased my confidence. And then I to just over time, you go through experiences, right? And you try things that work, you try things that fail, but you start to realize, you know, it's, there's no perfect decisions and there's no perfect 
um, it, there, there's no way to predict everything that will happen or what outcomes will be, but um, you need to keep, you just need to keep making decisions and you need to keep moving forward. And I think, you know, I've, um, to, to your point, I mean, I've had my fair share of, of adversity in life. So there, there's things like experiencing death at a young age. There's also, um, and Lizette, you know, some of this, but my, um, my father was an alcoholic. My brothers had some severe disabilities and schizophrenia. And just like if for me, as I've experienced adversity in life and I'm still here and I'm still finding ways to be happy or to thrive or, or to achieve my goals. It has given me a confidence of, I don't know what's going to happen or whether I'm going to make all the right decisions, but I have confidence that I'll be okay and I'll figure it out, that, that I'm confident in my ability to figure it out. And I think that's been just part of my personal journey and experience that has, has maybe created that confidence that you referenced of, you know, it's, it'll, I just know it'll be okay. I'm always going to do the right thing based on what I know in the moment. And as long as I lead from that place and make decisions from that place, I'll figure it out. I love that. I love, this is the perfect example of lived experience. And you're talking about the authenticity and how you were, he said you wasn't a chili. And it's like having that lived experience is what makes you, I think, especially in the role of nonprofit and different and dealing with different communities of all different backgrounds and having that experience can really help you identify in a way as you're, as you're going along in your journey, especially in nonprofit, I think, because it's, mm -hmm. if you can find a way to relate and oftentimes I think, excuse me, all of us do that have worked in nonprofit or do work in nonprofit, we can probably identify ourselves and some of this, some of the people that we encounter just by day to day. I know I talked a lot. So Lisette, pass it to you. If you want to throw questions at Lisa or pull some threads out here. Yeah, no, I think uh, I loved hearing uh, Lisa share, uh, just like you mentioned, the lived experience and, and sort of how that has really informed your leadership. And uh, and really, like, I can attest to the you know leadership uh, but leading with empathy, right? And I think that is such a core piece uh, that I see uh, a lot of women uh, have is sort of being able to lead with empathy a lot of times. Um, and it's very hard to find that in male leadership. I'm not saying it doesn't exist before everybody goes out here and starts saying all men and all these things. I know it does. I've had male leadership, but they do kind of lead with that. But um it's typically, and what I've noticed that it's, in, it's typically with, um, you know, men of color where I may see it more versus with white men in, in leadership. Um, and and kind of digging in a little bit more, Lisa, into your kind of journey into the the executive, executive leadership role that you currently have. And I definitely hope you continue growing and, and having more opportunities, but, you know, like, when you kind of look at um, the challenges, right, but navigating more from that uh, power dynamic that, that exists in a lot of our systems and industries where it's, it's very much a male dominated, uh, sometimes male preferred to be in leadership. Um, and sort of definitely seeing the thread of, you know, the patriarchal systems throughout uh, and, you know, nonprofit is no different uh, to to that aspect of it. So if you can just kind of share a little bit of sort of your experience in navigating that, uh, particularly the nonprofit world. So I think a lot of times people think the nonprofit is different from corporate America. Uh, but, you know, in my experience, it definitely runs. There are uh, nonprofit organizations that really run just the same as a corp as a corporate, you know, a large corporate uh, company. So just wanted to get your thoughts on that as we kind of dig in more into sort of your experience. Um, and as you kind of just encourage, you know, our audience who are, a lot of them are women uh, and wanting to kind of reach that, but, you know, we're all navigating that, that, that system and how we kind of have to 
really compete a lot of the times against uh, the men in our in our company because we there's a perception of what women are and who they innately are versus this sort of idea that men are natural leaders, which has been debunked, but it's still uh, very dominant in our industries. Yeah, it. I mean, it is, it is. I think I was reading a stat earlier. Well, if you look at women in it, the, so nonprofit like companies, it runs the gamut. You have your teeny tiny, like one person shop, and then you have your global billion dollar organizations or massive foundations or, you know, so there's a variety of size. And I know there's so much out there about the number of women CEOs for fortune 500 companies and, and all that kind of, of um, things. And so nonprofit is up much better, right? It's up much better. If you look at fortune 500 um, uh, companies, we're up to maybe 7% of the CEOs are women like 7%. Um, for for the large nonprofits, for lo- the nonprofits with those like, you know, revenues over 50 million, the national nonprofits, I think it's about 17%. Um, so a little bit better. But when you consider that 70 to 75% of the, you know, uh, workforce for nonprofits are women, and then for those large nonprofits, we're at 17% in those CEO or top leadership executive roles. I mean, something's missing there. Something's missing. And um, I've definitely encountered a number of things. I've, um, in my recent uh, last couple promotions, I've sort of been following in the footsteps of um, a male colleague who's been in these roles before me. And I nothing against him. I adore him. I actually think he's one of the more enlightened men in leadership when it comes to these types of things. But, um, you know, he's, he's given me good guidance and coaching when I've gone for these promotions and, you know, what salary should I ask for? Like that type of conversation. And in almost every case, I've gotten paid significantly less than him for the same job, same Mm -hmm. number of years experience going into the job. And um, I've gotten paid less. Um, and, you know, one of the, the and, and I'm aware of this, um, but one of the things, this last job promotion, and he had been in this role before me as well, and he's not the one deciding what I get paid. So I'll say that just to protect him. It's not not up to him. I think he would be fair. But um, our... Um, our um, head of human resources, you know, kind of has a say in, in this. And um, she's a woman for um, uh, our region, our national head of resources is, is a man, but I um, decided to turn her into my ally on this. Right. And so I, I said something to her about it and I talked to her about the issues and um, she and I have had conversations about how difficult it is for women to speak up or ask for a greater salary or advocate for themselves um, in general in the workforce. And then even more so if you're a woman, you know, a black woman or a Latina woman, you know, it's even many times harder um, to do that. And I know we've talked about that before, Lizette, but so she, she, I'm like, I'm having these conversations with her and she's in um, a role where she can influence this in a way that's, that's very impartial, right? It's not me pushing the button like a bulldog, though that's one way to do it, right? To use your voice aggressively. But I knew with um, the, the guy whose decision it was that I was dealing with that that would backfire on me. I mean, I've been in enough experiences with him to know that when a woman negotiates salary, he gets pissed. Um, so I went about it a different way and decided to find allies. My allies in the issue in general that could help change this for other women, but allies who could help me. And this last job offer was a lot more equitable. So, so that definitely paid off. But I do think allyship is important. Um, and you can find that in a lot of different ways, um, but or or from different places, or you know sometimes it's 
you know, one person overall who's an ally or advocate or mentor for you. And sometimes it's um, situational like this, where, you know, it's like this, this can't keep going for people beyond me either. Like it's not right. But then I also want it to change for myself, but I know enough that if I, if I were to have tackled that head on with the person, it definitely would have backfired on me. So I think as women, we sometimes have to navigate in different ways. A man would have just come in, maybe, I mean, and you said, this is what, what uh, I deserve. And it might've been a different conversation, but I don't know if that answered your question. I kind of went off on a tangent with an example. No, No, I think it was a perfect example of what those systems are. And like you mentioned, like, an individual has an idea of what they think women should or shouldn't be doing or sort of like, you know, ne- negotiating in general salary, I think is a ridiculous notion in my end, from my opinion, because I'm like, I, there should be transparency in salaries and all of that. And that's probably a conversation for a different day. <laughs> but I mean, it, it, it allows for these kind of situations to arise when there isn't that transparency where, you know, uh, you hear stories, um, as our audience know, Martina and I are big on TikTok. Um, so, we, we're, you know, I'll see a lot of like, uh, you know, people share on TikTok that, you know, they later found out that the person who had their previous, their, their, their role previously was making much more. And, he, and, and they were like, we had comparable um, skills and experience and, you know, and, and typically it's the woman that's making less than it's the, the person before was a, a, a man. Um, so yeah, like, I think we do have to uh, navigate differently to your point, Lisa, and we do have to find those, those allies and you have to find the right allies, right? Like, mm-hmm. because you allies, you know, you, you can find, but the right ones that can definitely, you know, change and have influence are the ones that you need uh you know like i'm glad you had someone that was able to support you and sort of encouraging you through that but also you know the person that had your role before to be able to like talk you through and how important it was uh for them to even just share like you know here's what i I mean here's what i was making that's what you need people to like (laughs) enlighten you you know and share like here's what you should fight for ask for and here's the thing like you know, if he'd been in the role two, three, five years, I wasn't at, you know, expecting what he exited the role at, right? Because you start at a salary, you might build merit over time, or you might have other things. Like, I understand that, that that's why we have ranges. But at least get me on par with what he started the role at, right? right? Yeah. Like, that, you know, I mean, that's, uh, yeah. yeah. And I'm just thinking, it was a lot of nerves for this man to be like he doesn't like he doesn't like women to negotiate their salaries I'm just I'm like it just makes me wonder what have women done to him like I just it just it just opens up a whole new world of questions for me (laughs) well and here's the thing like he has never said those words but he's shown that in action with me and I you know I have Action speaks louder than words (laughs) action speaks louder than words yes and I mean he has said the words he doesn't like it when people negotiate salaries, but he's only said that when the person is a woman. So, you know, the, the women part is what I have observed, um, in that. And, and, you know, he's got 350 or so, this might might be getting too specific now, but downline staff, I have 300 or so. So we have a lot of these conversations. We do a lot of hiring and promoting and, um, you know, a lot of these conversations. So. Well, I'm Um, glad you're in leadership, Lisa, because I know that you will try your hardest to uh, enact change. And I think uh, to have, you know, and this coming from, I think, uh, as two women of color, to have someone, you know, a white woman who understands uh, allyship, who understands sort of, because you were talking earlier about how women you know, sometimes struggle and, and, and have to, you know, prove themselves and are afraid uh, of failure. And I think to me, when you were talking like so many women of color, you know, just people of color in general, you know, that intersectionality that sometimes uh, 
white women don't understand or can't view. Like I, I know that when you were talking about it, and we've had conversations about this in the past, but to have someone that understands it and can view it uh, and can really speak on it from a genuine place. Uh, and to have some, you know, for you to be in, in a position of leadership that can uh, really just highlight and say, like, hey, here's how, you know, I feel as a woman, but here's how others might feel or, or might be navigating or having a hard time uh, to do that. Because, yeah, I think, you know, in the past, you know, in our channel, and Martina, I've talked about how, you know, we were afraid to not be perfect. We were afraid of failure because sometimes we are the only women of color or person of color on the team or in a room or in that position. And, you know, you're, it's not like your failure is just yours. Like your failure is anybody else is going to come behind you that may look like you. Um, so I think just that intersectionality uh, around it and to, and to hear you speak, you know, just throughout uh, about it just kind of speaks volumes to what you've done, I think, as a leader to kind of uh, learn about um, just being an ally and how important it is to find those uh, right individuals. And I love what you said, you're always going to do the right thing uh, with the knowledge that you have. Um, and not a lot of leaders would say that, you know, like, they're like I'm going to do the right thing that, or what's best for me and not so much the right thing. Uh, but yeah, I think that was just uh, some thoughts that I had as uh, you were sharing and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. We were, um, we, one of the, the processes we do once or twice a year is a talent review. So <clears throat> with our HR team, uh, each of our leaders or managers does does kind of a talent review, and we look at who's on our team, and um, you know what are their skills, what are their opportunities or um, areas for for continued skill building, and if we identify some of those, you know what's their interest in it, what what's their interest in career progression, and how do we help them get there? You know how are we really as leaders? carving out time to think about that for our staff. And I think if you're a good leader, you have good insight in that because you've had conversations with those individuals and you know, you know, what they're striving for or, um, you know, what, what that might look like. But so we were doing this talent review and um, talking about a specific uh, team member and their, um, what type of role they could grow into next. Uh, but one of the things that my friend, my ally in HR um, said, and that really struck me that I've reflected on is, you know, there's a lot of people that we look at, like they have the raw skills to do this leadership job. Sure. Absolutely. Um, maybe they have the years of experience. Maybe they have, you know, the concrete skills on paper or proven success or track record. But she said that to her, what what really makes the difference of are they a more progressive or modern leader? Meaning, where are they as we as an organization have more been more unapologetic about pushing a DEI um, initiative and agenda and being advocates for health equity or changing or innovating the way that we do things? Are they a leader who's been bold in standing up for that? or not like where where are they on that are they on the front line say you know before the organization tells them to do something because we certainly have leaders who are like oh yeah okay i'll do that i'll go along with this agenda and then we have leaders who are like i'm gonna create this agenda because it's the right thing um and and that was just it, it's something i've been reflecting on because i think there's a lot of talent that um I get to work with that are like, yeah, they're very talented. But when you put that other layer on it, there's a much smaller pool of individuals who are willing to kind of stick their neck out to create change. Um, but that's what we as women need. And sometimes it's us who will be it, but it can't only be us who will be it. Yeah. But people of color, women, you know, marginalized groups um, in general, that's what we need. We need those leaders who are going to stick their neck out to be that more progressive leader, to not, um, to, to look at what could be and move organizations in the world in that direction versus 
you know, just looking at how do I continue to be successful or how do I continue to get promoted or, you know, those things that might be right in front of you. Um, so that's something lately I've been reflecting on a lot. And I can think of areas where I've been that leader and maybe times where I haven't. But I definitely want to be, you know, that's that's definitely the type of leader I want to be. Um, so, so that was interesting to me, especially coming into this conversation. I have that on my mind a lot. You hit the nail on the head for me, Elisa. Mm -hmm. That was actually one thing I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, with you is just, you know, being a woman who is a leader and how do you, you know, push forward for these ideas and these, like you said, modern new ways of thinking that the country may be going in and, you know, you have your belief and you think, you know, this is how we get here. And like, this is how we're gonna change all these systems. You know, this is the way forward. How do you navigate that? But hearing you talk a little bit about that kind of helped me understand that that is something that you specifically is, is advocating for, is moving in the progression of the change. Cause I think sometimes, and this could be just leaders in general, having to compete with, you know, what's going on in the world possibly or something that may be very specific to your organization that is happening in the world. And there may be one belief out here that may be two, it may be three. And how do you get the company to push forward on, I guess, the quote unquote, the right way or the right way forward? Right, right. And, you know, I don't, many times it's, it's a slow and frustrating process, I think. It doesn't always have to be, but um, this is, this is not even pro a progressive example. This is not, a, this is like a, how do we just catch up example to where we need to be? Yep. But, um, I was in a leadership role for one of our employee resource groups and it was employee resource group specifically for parents. And we, we launched this during the pandemic when it first hit and we realized, um, you know, we have all of these parents majority working mothers who now have their kids at home and are trying to figure this out. And we as an organization need to show up for them. We need to give them whether it's just a platform to connect and vent or to share resources, whatever it may be. So we launched this employee resource group for, for parents. And I was on the initial leadership team. And one of the things that um, we tackled uh, for the organization was parental leave. And there were elements of this that I knew and elements that I didn't know until I, until I started having these conversations. I have two kids. Um, my first baby uh, I had with this organization, I had left and, and had my second somewhere else, but um, the policy really hadn't changed since then. Uh, but we didn't have any official paid leave policy. We had short-term disability for six weeks at a fraction of your, your salary. And then you could take six weeks according to federal law unpaid. Um, so we had short-term disability insurance, but we didn't have an actual company you know, funded leave policy. And then, so I knew that part. What I didn't know, um, certainly we had no paternal leave at all um, for dads. If you um, were adopting or having a baby via a surrogate or anything besides like a traditional, you know, path, um, I used air quotes on that, but a traditional path, you didn't get any benefits at all. You didn't, you weren't eligible for short-term disability because that was tied to the fact that you're physically giving labor. Like it was tied to the physical element and a doctor's note that you need recovery time. That's what that benefit is, is tied to. Um, so as I talked to staff, we're like, uh, you know, having this new baby, I have zero time off. I'm going to use my PTO for two weeks and then I'm done, you know. And we are an organization, as many nonprofits are, where the workforce is largely women. Um, and we talk about health and well-being. And what's more poor to a woman sometimes than, than maternal health for many of us, not, you know, not all women experience that, but it, it can be core for many of us. And, and just that family health overall, no matter how you bring a baby into your family. So through um, the leadership role in the ERG, me and two other um, of the executive leaders of the ERG decided to do research, you know, what, what else exists out there, get feedback, build a case and bring it to our CEO. 
Um, and it took some time and we didn't get everything we asked for, but we now have a paid leave policy and we now have, um, put, you know, f- uh, leave for fathers and we now have leave it for different types of, of um, family beginning experiences. And it's not perfect. It could be a lot better than it is, but we made progress. Um, and again, like that, that's not that progressive because we're behind, we're behind the times on what we should be doing there. Um, though most nonprofits are most, most big nonprofits, their policies are very similar. <laughs> Many are behind the times. Um, but it, it's, a an example of creating and advocating for that change of seeing a need putting in the work on how you think you're going to convince, you kind of have to know who, who the decision makers are, what do they need to know to convince them? Some people need data and numbers. Some people need emotional stories and storytelling. Some people need all of it, but then building that case in in that way um, and using your own might sound crass to say it, but any internal political power that you have, I mean, that's one of the things as I've grown in leadership roles is I know now, right or wrong, that because of my title, my voice, or even just an email with my name on it, will make something happen that it might not for someone else. So right or wrong, how do I use that to to create the change um, that 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 I want to create, you know, um, or that we need? And and so an awareness of that. Um I, I a humble awareness of that, I think, is how I would actually phrase that, um, is important. Awesome, yeah. Well, I know we are getting close to time on this part one with Lisa. <laughs> so that means everybody has to come back because we're gonna do yeah. a part two with Lisa as well. And we're gonna get into, um, if you have watched our series that we did um, like a little while back now, is to Why Men Hate Women, we kind of referenced the book there. And we're gonna talk about some of those things with Lisa uh, and get a little bit to, you know, more to her life, maybe a little bit outside of being this high power executive and, you know, how that goes along with with her just being a mom, being a woman in general. And um, so, you know, I'll turn it over to Lisette to get us wrapped up. And then Lisa, if you have any words to take us home too. Actually, I was going to just uh, ask Lisa if she had anything, just some final uh, sort of uh, golden nuggets for the women that are watching uh, watching us or sort of, you know, what encouraging kind of words you might give to someone uh, like ourselves, like Martina and I, who are in our own professional journey and wanting to get to those uh, levels of, of leadership um, and others who are listening or watching, you know, what are some, you know, whether it's advice, whether it's just some encouraging words um, or anything that kind of just helped you in your journey. And then, uh, then I'll close, close those out. Yeah. Uh, the pressure on that, right. <laughs> I feel like for part two, I'll have to really give this thought to have some strong words at the end of that. But I mean, I think from what we've talked about today, that allyship is, is important. Um uh, using your own life experiences, you know, really growing from every experience you have, figuring out what you can learn or grow from that, um, I think is, is important and fighting against that fear, um, that fear about not being perfect or that fear that prevents you from raising your voice, I think is, um, something we all need to practice as women, uh, and women in leadership. Uh, and then I'll say, I, I saw this quote and it's going to sound pretty familiar. I think it's Charlotte Witten and, um, but, but it has a last line to it that was different to me and it, it kind of made me smile. So it's whatever women do, they must do twice as well as men to be thought half as good. Luckily, mm-hmm. this is not difficult. <laughs> Yeah, that is yeah. that's so true. And it's so unfortunate that we're still in that world, but that is absolutely true. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you, Lisa. Thank you for not just your, your final words, but just, you know, joining 
uh, Martine and I and our, our viewers and listeners uh, in sharing a little bit about your journey. And as Martina said, we're going to come back for part two. So encourage our, our audience to make sure you follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, so you can kind of get notified when uh, part two ha- has gone live and you can uh keep hearing Lisa share her her knowledge and experiences. And as we're going to dig in a little bit more to just being a a woman uh, in in general in our society and and how that kind of translates even to the workplace and things. But thank you all for for listening and we will uh, see you and talk to you next time. 